So, are you scared yet? Are you worried? Are you nervous about all the things that are going on in the world around us? Well, I'll tell you, if you're not, you'd be in a small company of people. With everything that's happened uh, in politics, in the culture, uh, most of us are anxious about something. Hi, my name's Mark Lutz. I'm the Growth and Healing Pastor and the Director of Life Reset Ministries at Vineyard Cincinnati Church. And in these next three sessions, I want to uh, guide our thinking around anxiety. I want to lift up three different problems and give you some solutions to fight back against anxiety. I want you to have a battle plan uh, to fight back for your calm and your peace. So to start with, I want to have a definition of anxiety uh, that we would all be working from. Everyone's felt anxiety. We know what, it, what the experience is like. But in order for us to think through this, I want us to think about it in this way. Anxiety is anticipatory fear. That is, we're afraid of something in the future. We're anticipating something is going to happen to us. And it's going to uh, have unpleasant, uh, bad consequences. And so we're afraid of that thing happening. Uh, the problem I want to talk about today around this anxiety, anticipatory fear, is that one of the things that can generate and drive anxiety is that I demand the impossible of myself. Now, sometimes it'll take uh, words, and like in our self-talk, that running dialogue we have in our head, sometimes it won't even take the shape of words. It'll be more like a, an intuitive, instinctive sense, a thing that we feel and uh, when it's in that subconscious level, it's hard to do anything about. So I want to bring that subconscious into the light so we can see it, we get an idea about it, and then maybe we can do something about it. So uh, the way this demanding uh, the impossible of myself might go is the, the unspoken self-talk might go something like this. You must. Well, I can't. You have to. Well, it's impossible. Do it anyway. Well, it can't be done, and yet you must do it. So there's this battle inside of us. Do the impossible, I can't do the impossible. And as long as that uh, battle is growing, uh, the feeling of anxiety will never subside. As long as the demand is there, it will continue to grow, get bigger, be more problematic. For some people, it grows so big uh, that it creates panic attacks uh, or emotional breakdowns. This insisting that we do the impossible. Uh, I, I will give you some specifics that will help make more sense of this and see if you recognize yourself in any of these demands to do the impossible. I must get all people to like me, to approve of me, to validate me, to give me my worth and my value and my identity. When you think about it, you can't get 12 people to agree about anything, much less get everyone to agree that they like you. I must always succeed. I must never fail. Uh, you can tell uh, if that one's at work in that a lot of times you'll be afraid to do a new thing uh, unless you're really sure that you could succeed. And so with that uh, impossible belief upon yourself, you might not try very many things. Or those things that you're doing, uh, if you do fail, you won't be able to admit it. So you end up being that guy who can't admit he's made a mistake and uh, ask for forgiveness. Uh, I must know the future. I must be in control of my world, of the world. I cannot have or show needs or weakness. Well, the deal is we all have needs, and I don't know anyone who's strong in everything, so that's impossible. I cannot survive any more pain, and so I cannot allow any more pain to happen to me. And that's pretty difficult to do in a broken world surrounded by broken people. I must expend limitless time and energy to avoid disappointing anyone, bosses, friends, family, church community. Well, the problem there is I don't have limitless time and energy. My time and energy is limited, which means I get to a point where I'm done and there ain't no more. And when I push on beyond that, bad things start to happen. So I said the anxiety is anticipatory fear. Uh, but we don't have what the thing is that we're afraid of because we've, so far we've only really given the first half of a sentence. The second half is hiding still. It's an unspoken second half of each of these sentences, and that's what drives the anxiety. So how you get a, a thing to emerge and come into view is we have to ask this question of each of those things. Or what? 
So uh, I, uh, I must get all people to like me, to approve of me, to validate me, and give me worth or identity, or what? Or I'll be a nobody, and I'll have no worth. Uh, I must always succeed. I must never fail. Or what? Or uh, I'll be looked down on. I'll be disrespected. I must know the future. Why? To prevent catastrophe. I must be in control of my world, of the world. Why? To hold off chaos. I cannot survive any more pain. I must avoid it at all costs. Or what? Or I'll be destroyed. I cannot have or show need or weakness, or what, or I'll be exploited, I'll be taken advantage of. I must expend limitless time and energy to avoid disappointing anyone, bosses, friends, family, church community, or what, or I'll be passed over, rejected, fired. So you see there, there's a demand to do the impossible, and then the assertion that some very painful circumstance uh, will surely come my way. Now, if that weren't bad enough, we do one more thing to just sort of lock the anxiety in place. And, and we call it this. We call it awfulizing. Awfulizing. So we say the thing and then add, it'll be awful. I must expend limitless time and energy to avoid disappointing anyone, bosses, family, friends, or church community, or I will be passed over, rejected, fired, and that will be awful, horrible, horrible unsurvivable. One clue to whether we are awfulizing is if we hear this in our self-talk, what if, what if, what if, and usually what that is is we're jumping to the consequence that we're afraid of, that we're anticipating. So uh, what if people don't like me? What if I fail? What if someone sees my weakness? What if I'm a disappointment to my pastor? And then the usual implied answer is, that would be awful. That would be horrible. That would be unbearable. Now, often the reason that we would choose one of these impossible things to demand of ourselves is because earlier in our life, this or something very like it happened, and it was very painful. And if it happened when we were young, when we were small, uh, the pain could have seemed very big. And we could have seemed very small and, and helpless in comparison. And so we remember it as this traumatic thing. And so now as we're adults, we say, well, I can never let that happen again. And so we make a vow to ourselves. I promise I will never let chaos, the unknown, uh, rejection, whatever the painful thing was, I will never let that happen again. I will never let myself experience those things. And then we insist and we demand the impossible of ourselves in order to fulfill these inner vows. And when we do this, we put all these things together, it creates anxiety. So I want to uh, put forth a couple of solutions, to parts of our battle plan for pushing back against this, this aspect of demanding the impossible of ourselves. Uh, here's what we do instead. Uh, we let God be in charge of the impossible, and we start telling ourselves the truth. Uh, it, it doesn't cause God anxiety to tackle the impossible. I think probably it's not even really interesting to him until things are impossible. So he's perfectly capable to do that. We, not so much. But I got to start telling myself true things. So here's examples of true things that you will have to begin to tell yourself. God approves of me, gives me worth. He sets my identity and his judgment is superior to any man's. I humble myself, and I admit my failures, my imperfection, and I trust God to remedy any of those consequences. I cannot know the future, but I can know the one who does, and I can decide if that's good enough. I'm in control of almost nothing, uh, especially not the world, but I'm guarded by the one who's in control of everything. When I have the courage to share my vulnerability, I have the chance of getting my needs met. I can survive pain, and while it will be unpleasant, it won't be awful. In fact, many times, I will come out with greater strength, wisdom, connection to God, 
as a result of having gone through that pain. I can work within my limits of time and energy with priorities that I set that are consistent with God's values. And then I can trust God for my success in whatever promotion I'm to experience. Now, in the helping world, we have an expression that says, uh, insight alone does not produce change. In other words, I can have an idea, oh yeah, this makes sense. I was telling myself the impossible. I need to start telling myself this true thing. That doesn't guarantee uh, a change. What we realize is that it's a good start, but we have to get the truth from here, from our minds, down into our hearts, down into our deep knower, where we become fully persuaded, where we become convinced, and it starts expressing itself in, in how we act and, and what we do and say. So uh, a, a part of the battle plan is, yes, telling ourselves the truth, but then even further, meditating on the truth. And I like uh, finding a place where God has told me the truth. So find a passage of Scripture where God has clearly spoken the truth, and then I begin meditating on that. So I have my three go-to scriptures for just uh, anxiety in general. When I'm starting to feel anxious about something, uh, I go to these three. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In 1 Peter 5, 5-7, through God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, so that in due time He may lift you up. Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So I start to run these scriptures through my mind, and I, I think about them over and over, and I make my brain evaluate them to say, do I believe this is true? And I make my brain make the decision, am I going to commit to this truth? And every time I make my brain do that work, it strengthens the synaptic passage, uh, passages in my brain, and that belief becomes a little more mine. Now, those are my generic ones, but sometimes uh, I need a, a specific word uh, because there's a, a new little wrinkle uh, that the enemy's using to try to uh, keep the anxiety uh, stuck to me. And recently, one of those uh, was this belief, this lie, that uh, I'm just too insignificant. There's been so many people, so many people on the planet now, so many people have ever been. There's no way God really uh, can keep track of me. There's no way he has a interest in me personally. There's no way he's going to be available to help me with the things I'm concerned about. That was the lie that was in my head. So I needed a scripture that very specifically spoke to that. And so here's one I found, Psalm 139. You have searched me, O God, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your presence? Where could I flee from your spirit? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you, and the night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because you are fearful. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How awesome concerning me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. So this passage of Scripture speaks very specifically 
to the lie that the enemy was running through my mind. And so I took this scripture and I, I ran it through my mind over and over. I rehearsed it. I practiced it. I ran it through my mind until my mind was saturated in the truth of this scripture. And as that began to happen, I could feel the scripture, the truth of that starting to sink down into my heart. I could feel uh, my inner self beginning to believe that, yes, I think that is true. So you may need to find a specific verse for a particular part of the anxiety that you're experiencing. I say call your pastor. They'll be glad to help you. We love helping people with those kinds of requests. So keep this in mind as we wrap up here. I want you to think about this. Uh, be alert to demands to do the impossible that you're placing on yourself and uh, the awfulizing that might be happening. And begin to practice recognizing and choosing to embrace the truth and to let God be in charge of the impossible. In the next session, we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, this battle strategy, the, the problem of worry versus faith. And so until till then, keep fighting. Keep fighting for your peace and for your calm.